If dog people made dog food, it definitely wouldn't look like dusty, burnt brown pebbles. Ugh. It would actually be food. It would be made with real, fresh meat and veggies, gently cooked to preserve their nutritional value. You know, like food. The Farmer's Dog was created by dog people who cook and deliver fresh, healthy food. Try the Farmer's Dog and get fresh, pre-portioned meals tailored to your dog's needs. Tell us about your dog, build your plan, and get 50% off at thefarmersdog.com slash podcast. That's thefarmersdog.com slash podcast. This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Will Johnson. The show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. She was um, super bubbly and so friendly. That girl can make a friend with a tree. We'll get up every day and remember her. And like she said, let her legacy live on and do our best to make sure the kids know um, how wonderful she was. Hell, when she was talking to me on the phone, she may have had the phone in one hand and a baby in the other. And... Heidi in the back, so I, I don't I don't know. We loved you. You were welcomed in our home. And we cared for you in our home. You know, where what were you thinking to murder our daughter? Thirty three year old Heidi Broussard went missing from Austin, Texas with her newborn daughter Margot in December of 2019. One week later, investigators swarmed a residence in Houston, where a longtime friend of Heidi's named Megan Fieramuska was living. Much of this case has been playing out in Houston over the past 24 hours. At a press conference the next day, police said they'd located an infant they believed to be Margot, as well as a body they believed to be Heidi's. They also revealed that they had made an arrest and would soon confirm that the person arrested at the home was Heidi's friend. Megan Firamuska. And this woman, Megan Firamuska, described as a close, longtime friend of Broussard's, she's been arrested. Megan Firamuska is still in custody here in in Harris County. The suspect, Megan Firamuska, now in custody, charged with two counts of kidnapping and one count of tampering with the corpse. For many, the thought of losing a loved one is already a haunting nightmare. But what if you never knew what happened to them? What if they disappeared without a trace? This is Will Johnson with True Crime Chronicles. I've been listening to The Vanished podcast regularly for a while now. It's a podcast that really takes a deep dive into cases of missing people. Host Marissa Jones' interviews with family and friends are in-depth and often powerful and emotional. The cases she covers are complicated and troubling, and Marissa approaches each one with sensitivity and incredible detail. She talks to investigators about the cases, the evidence, the searches, and brings listeners the most up-to-date information on these unsolved mysteries. Ultimately, The Vanish seeks to bring justice for those who've disappeared and shine a new light on their cases. Listen to The Vanished on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcast. Or listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. The Boy Scouts knew they had a problem. Parents gave the Boy Scouts the most valuable thing they had, their children. And they told parents, you can trust us. They are unbelievably heartbreaking stories. This is about how to move from victim to survivor. When the detective says he confessed to abusing you, I no longer had to prove to people that I was abused. I was free. The powerful new investigative documentary, Leave No Trace, A Hidden History of the Boy Scouts, streaming now on Hulu. Well, family called us first, and then I called, talked to the detectives up in Austin, and uh, we talked several times with detectives. And uh, they said, we just don't have anything yet on the investigation. It's narrowing this thing down to an area that we think we need to search. Earlier in the investigation, Heidi Broussard's family members had reached out to a search and rescue organization called Texas EcuSearch. KHOU, a local news station in Houston, spoke to the organization's founder, Tim Miller, following the arrest of Megan Firamuska. And he asked me, he said, have you found any areas? And I said, well, I did, but I don't know if it make any sense. I said, I rode around with Shane for a long time. I, you know, I spent a good part of the day with him. Shane Carey, Heidi's fiance. And, uh, you know, we hate to 
go up there and spend a lot of money and burn up a bunch of resources with just shooting an arrow in the sky wherever it comes down. That's where you start. So we stayed in close touch. I talked to Shane almost every day. Uh, Shane was frustrated at best. and uh, He took a lot of heat. He took a lot of heat. And, and Shane would call me and say, man, they brought me in, they polygraphed me, they kept me seven and a half hours and stuff. And he got upset with him. He called him some names that we can't say. And he said, if I had anything to do with it, squeeze it out of me. How can I can't squeeze it out of me? And, uh, you know, and Shane was questionable in my mind. He was, and his stories weren't just quite as consistent as I thought. But I got to remember, I went through that my own self. Tim Miller founded Texas AccuSearch following the abduction and murder of his daughter, Laura Miller. He's experienced firsthand a loved one going missing. And in the very beginning, there's a lot of different things going through your head. So I understand it now. Now I understand it. But then, uh, you know, another friend gave me some uh, friends of Heidi's and said, why don't you call him? So my first call was to uh, Megan. And she answered the phone, and I told her who I was, and she said, yeah, I've seen you on TV so many times, and just thank you for helping find my friend. And I said, well, Megan, I said, what's your heart telling you on this? And she said, Shane did it. She says, uh, I, I was there 10 years ago when they met. I told Heidi, stay away from this guy. He's trouble. The relationship's on and off. There's been a lot of abuse going on. Shane keeps saying, well, that baby's not even mine and stuff. She called me back in May and said that her and Shane had a terrible fight. And, and, uh, and she just went on and on and on and, uh, to the point that literally probably 45 minutes later, I said, Megan, listen, I got I to gotta go. I'm getting a call on the other line. And said, Mr. Miller, thank you for what you're doing. She says... I'm going to keep talking to people and everything. If I come up with anything, is it okay if I call you? And I said, Megan, please do. Please call me. And, uh, I mean, looking back at that conversation on Sunday to now, uh, there was not one single indication that I would ever believe she had anything to do with it. So, uh, you know, and, and... here she's at the hospital with Heidi when she has a baby. Here she is after Heidi gets out at the house helping and everything. Here's a, supposedly the best friend. So, Best uh, friend. Not just a friend, best friend. Well, best friends. Yeah, she had like three really, really close friends and, and uh, Megan was, was right there. When the baby was born. When the baby was born. We heard she went to baby appointments with her. Before. Oh yes, she did everything. Did she? Um, did you ask her? Um, was she forthcoming about maybe the last time she saw? Well, I asked her. I said, "Now, have you talked to detectives?" And Megan said, "Yeah, they they called me because uh, you know it looks like maybe I was the last one to talk to her." And, and uh, we talked that morning, probably around eight thirty, because she uh, was having problems breastfeeding. And I said, but you didn't tell them about all this other stuff you're telling me? And she said, no, they didn't ask me about anything. They just asked me what our last conversation was like. And I said, Megan, don't you think maybe you need to call them? Uh, I said, it it sounds like maybe there's some information about Shane and in that relationship that they really need to know. And with you being a best friend, it couldn't come from anybody better. So, she certainly had me convinced that uh, I mean, she cried on the phone. So then uh, last night when we was up there at the house, I started thinking about it. And hell, when she was talking to me on the phone, she may have had the phone in one hand and the baby in the other and Heidi in the back. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Your conversation with her was Sunday? Sunday. Sunday afternoon, probably... 3.30, 4 o'clock. After Megan Fieramuska was arrested and charged with kidnapping and tampering with a corpse, KVU reporter Tony Blahetsky would learn some shocking information from sources in law enforcement who told him that Fieramuska had been faking her own pregnancy as part of a plot 
to take Heidi's baby. Law enforcement sources also say that Fira Muska pretended to be pregnant to coincide with Heidi Broussard's pregnancy and was in Austin for Margot's birth. An arrest affidavit unsealed in the weeks after Megan Fira Muska's arrest would allege that she had been living this lie for months. Police say Megan Faramuska fooled everyone around her, including Heidi Broussard and the man she was living with in Houston who believed he was going to be a father. Instead, police say she intended all along to pretend Broussard's baby was hers. Police say Broussard also believed Faramuska was pregnant and that the two had discussed the chances of them having their babies the same day. According to the affidavit, Heidi's fiance Shane said he had seen Megan in person during her pregnancy and that she was visibly pregnant, even holding her hands to her, quote, apparently pregnant stomach, appearing to support the weight of her unborn child, end quote. Shane also said Megan drove to Austin to be there when Heidi gave birth in late November, and that they'd given Megan a key to their apartment on November 26th, a key that Shane says was never returned. Police officers spoke with a nurse at the hospital where Heidi gave birth, and the nurse said she overheard Heidi and Megan talking about Megan's pregnancy. She was at the hospital when Heidi gave birth to Margot. Bryce Newberry was covering this case for KVU in Austin at the time. She also spoke with Heidi about being 37 weeks pregnant, according to a nurse who overheard their conversation at the hospital. So she was in town during the birth. Shane also told investigators Megan was in the actual room when Heidi delivered her baby, and that as family members were taking turns holding baby Margot, Megan interjected herself immediately after Shane's father was handed his grandchild, asking to hold the newborn child and stating that she had to leave. Once baby Margot was born, the baby's grandfather told police he was suspicious of Faramuska. He claimed she interrupted him meeting his granddaughter for the first time and asked to hold the baby first, which he thought was odd. Shane said he later heard from Heidi that Megan had given birth on December 8th, four days before Heidi and Margot went missing. Shane Carey said he found out that Fiera Muska had delivered a baby girl, but he didn't see any pictures of the baby. The affidavit goes on to say that on December 19th, 2019, Investigators were conducting surveillance of the residence in Houston that Megan Firamuska was sharing with a man named Christopher Green. Investigators reported that Christopher Green left the home at some point during the day and drove to a Target store where he shopped for baby clothes and baby formula. Texas Department of Public Safety officers spoke with Green as he exited the store. When they eventually interviewed her boyfriend, Christopher, um, he said that they had actually broken up He never saw Megan Fiaramuska's stomach bare during what she claimed was her pregnancy. And he believed that she was pregnant with his child. At this point, Green was shown a flyer produced by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, featuring images of Heidi Broussard and her newborn child, Margot. According to the affidavit, Christopher Green looked at the photos and stated, that's the baby at my house. When Christopher Green was being interviewed in Houston that day by police, it became clear throughout the course of about a 30-minute conversation with the Texas Rangers that he was not so convinced that the baby at his house was actually his. And according to a recording that's been played now throughout the court process, you know, he, he did say, go get that baby. To the investigators. Investigators also spoke to Megan Fiaramuska on December 19th. She told them that on December 12th, she left home while Christopher Green was working, and the next day, returned home with a baby. She claimed that she went into labor and delivered their baby without his knowledge, but she couldn't remember and wouldn't say where she reported giving birth. So that was a little bit suspicious as well. Houston news station KHOU spoke with somebody else who interacted with Megan Firamuska throughout her supposed pregnancy, a Houston lawyer who had been appointed to represent Megan 
in an unrelated case prior to her arrest in this case. Megan Faramuska was arrested on a charge of felony theft for allegedly stealing money from an Ace Express check cashing business where she worked as an assistant manager. Her appointed attorney, Eric Devlin, says the case was dismissed for lack of evidence. I can tell you the theft case she's charged with, I absolutely believe she was innocent. Um, and I think we proved that she was innocent of, of it. Devlin says from their first meeting to their last one in November, Faramuska came across as being nice and showed signs of being pregnant. When I first met her, she was not pregnant, clearly did not appear to be pregnant at all. At the last setting, she appeared to be very pregnant. Law enforcement sources confirmed to our sister station KVU in Austin that Faramuska faked her pregnancy. But Devlin never once doubted that Faramuska was expecting. It, it, it didn't seem like she was faking anything. I mean, she appeared to be doing what we call the, the pregnant waddle. I mean, I'm married. I've got two kids. I've seen that, that happen. I mean, she appeared to be uncomfortable. Devlin says her behavior never raised any red flags. That is something that, that, that we uh, are required to look at. I mean, we, if we have a concern about our mental health, we will have them cite, uh, have them evaluated in some way. I had no concerns whatsoever about it when I, when I interacted with her. Friends of Heidi's were shocked when they learned that Megan Fieramuska had been charged. As KHOU reported, one of those friends was on a live podcast as things were starting to unravel at the home. One of Heidi's best friends, Carissa Nolte, was a live guest on a podcast called Jay is for Justice. I think they're just hopeful that she returns no matter what. At the same time, information started rolling in about a search at a home on Bojack Drive. The hosts Googled the address. There is a baby registry to the owners of that house. Megan... Humphrey and Christopher Green have the baby registry. Is oh my from- God, that's Megan's house. Oh my God. Oh my God. What? What? That's Megan, her best friend that met her at church camp with me. Carissa says they all met 24 years ago in Columbus, Texas. Heidi stayed close to Megan, but Carissa just reconnected with her since Heidi went missing. I've talked to Megan every day all day. She's been like sick over this. She's, she's had a baby and she's breastfeeding. Isn't she- this girl, Megan, just what? had a baby? Yes. How long and ago? Her name's Luna. She's 14, 15 days old, 16 days old. Her and Heidi are best, best friends. She was there in the room when Heidi had Margo. Did you see her baby? I haven't seen pictures of her. But it's a girl? Yes. Megan for sure, like, had a baby. She said she told us she went to a birthing center and had her baby. <gasps> Throughout the interview, Carissa says Megan told her she's a wedding planner in Houston and her baby's name is Luna May. Although Carissa never saw the baby, she did hear her over the phone. I even told her she sounded sweet. Within a few days, the baby recovered from Megan Fieramuska's home was confirmed to be Margot Carey, Heidi Broussard and Shane Carey's daughter. And the body found in a duffel bag was confirmed to be that of Heidi Broussard. The family of Heidi Broussard has released their first statement since Heidi's body was found this week. Tammy Broussard, Heidi's mother, released the following statement. The family is overwhelmed with grief. We're getting through as a family. We are blessed to have many of Heidi's friends to help, and Austin and Lake Charles community have been wonderful with their support and kindness, and we're very grateful to them. Now, Heidi's mother says that the family is focusing now on spending time with Heidi's six-year-old son, the last time I talked to Heidi was the Tuesday before she went missing. Another friend of Heidi's, Rachel West, shared memories of Heidi in a FaceTime interview with KHOU. She um, she was on her way home um, from dropping off her mom with her father and Katie. And she called me from Bastrop because she was almost to the Bucky's in Bastrop. And we had a great conversation. Tell us about her as a, as a person. What was Heidi like? She was... Um, super bubbly and so friendly that girl can make a friend with a tree and just have a conversation like she was so her her the energy she brought to wherever she was or whoever she was with was intoxicating um yeah she just she's warm to me she's home and uh you know she's love and joy and grace and just she's incredible how long had you known each other Uh, for four years and where did you meet? At the Beauty Cracker Barrel. We worked together. Oh, you worked together at Cracker Barrel. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know Megan? Um, no. I knew of Megan. Um, the um, first and only time I ever met Megan, though, was um, in May, right um, after Heidi found out she was pregnant. 
That's it. Did you ever, in knowing Megan, did you think she was pregnant or did she ever tell you or did Heidi say, oh, my friend Megan's pregnant or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, she, um, uh, she, uh, Heidi told me Megan was pregnant and, uh, when Megan, when Megan said she was pregnant, which is not true, um, you know, she was kind of freaking out and Heidi being the amazing person she is, um, was like, yeah, come stay with me for a few days, you know? And then, um, me, Megan, Heidi, and another friend of ours went to the green belt and just, we had a great day that day. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now knowing everything that happened, um, what what's your hope that comes out of all this? Uh, justice for my girl. Just that's it, and some answers. Like I don't think it's hit me yet because there's a lot of um, unanswered questions and a lot of missing puzzle pieces still. But um, but yeah, just justice. On December 23rd, community members came together to honor Heidi Broussard at a vigil in Austin. Bathed in candlelight. You are with us. A crowd larger than expected to honor the memory of Heidi Broussard. She put a smile on every, everyone's face. As soon as she walked in the room, she just lit up everyone's face. Monday night's vigil at Garrison Park in South Austin happened a few days after investigators found Heidi's body at a home in Houston in the trunk of her so-called best friend's car. Her baby girl found safe and alive inside the home, soon to be reunited with her father and Heidi's fiance, Shane Carey. It's, it's just beyond, beyond comprehension to watch your son or some, you know, you know he didn't do it all gone thing. And you know how much he loved her, and you know, it's just unbelievable. Hades' loved ones and strangers came together for prayer and song to remember a woman whose death touched so many, including one of her co-workers, Rachel West. The hardest thing for me is um, feeling all the emotion from her son. I was there when they told him. What happens next is uncertain as the investigation into Heidi's murder continues. But one thing is clear. Heidi's family is not alone in their mourning. We appreciate all the love that everybody's showing. And uh, I mean, we really, really do. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see people come together like this. And uh, I know Heidi would love it also. The next day, on December 24th, baby Margot was finally reunited with her father. Margot was actually uh, held in foster care while police and CPS verified her identity. And then, within a few days, Margot was reunited with her father, Shane, and the rest of the family. The following week, Bryce Newberry would travel to Heidi's home state of Louisiana for her memorial service. At Heidi's funeral, there was a lot of media interest, first of all. Stations from Houston, Louisiana, Austin, as well as national news all came for Heidi's funeral. And it was a really emotional funeral. Someone described her as a star in the middle of darkness. Someone else described her as the perfect mother. A lot of people in the room were moved to tears throughout the funeral. You could hear people crying. But above the sound of other people crying or speaking, you could also hear the crying and fussing from baby Margot. She was only about one month old at that time. And, you know, everyone who was there, you know, obviously some of Heidi's closest friends spoke and just encouraged everyone to think about Heidi moving forward for the light and joy that she always carried. Uh, one of her close childhood friends uh, said, you know, that they will wake up every day and remember her. We'll get up every day and remember her. And like she said, let her legacy live on and do our best to make sure the kids know um, how wonderful she was. After the funeral, they all gathered at the cemetery and released balloons into the sky in her memory. And then that night, a lot of her high school classmates gathered on the waterfront in Lake Charles. They all shared memories. They sang hallelujah. It was a lot for everyone to process, but it really seemed like she had so many friends and family back home 
that still cared about her too. Meanwhile, investigators were continuing to build a case against Megan Fieramuska, leading to a new charge in late January of 2020. We are following breaking news tonight. This woman, 34-year-old Megan Fieramuska, has now been charged with capital murder. Authorities say she strangled her childhood friend, Heidi Broussard, in a plot to kidnap her newborn daughter, Margot. Senior reporter Tony Pohetsky is here now with the latest. Tony? Mike and Terry, authorities have previously stopped short of saying the woman from the Houston area was responsible for Heidi Broussard's death, but today's indictment makes clear that investigators do think she killed the Austin mom. A grand jury indicted Faramuska on a charge of capital murder by terror threat. The indictment says she killed Broussard by strangling her with a ligature, a leash, and with her hands. Her bond was set at $1 million. Faramuska was also indicted on a kidnapping charge. Her bond in that case was set at $200,000. Faramuska does remain in the Travis County Jail. Her attorneys have said that she is innocent until proven guilty. That was back in January of 2020. But this case has yet to go to trial. COVID, of course, delayed in-person trials in Travis County like it did in so many other counties as well. At the same time, there has been some change in Megan's defense team. There's also been some change in the prosecutor's office in Travis County as well. There was an election in late 2020 that brought a new judge to the court that's overseeing Megan's case. And that also brought a new district attorney to Travis County. So there have been a lot of factors at play. There, are, there have been somewhat regular status hearings, uh, just pre-trial activities that need to happen. But between all of those factors, you know, it hasn't been moving very quickly. Earlier this year, Megan Fieramuska was back in court. Today in court, Fiera Muska's attorneys argued that police entered Fiera Muska's home without a warrant. They say evidence obtained from the home should not be used for that very reason. Fiera Muska's team also said Fiera Muska was illegally detained that day in 2019, and statements she provided to police should be suppressed. Travis County prosecutors countered those claims, saying law enforcement had the right to enter the home because they believed Broussard's baby was in imminent danger and that the home wasn't searched until warrants were signed hours later. Prosecutors further testified that Fierre Muska voluntarily spoke with police the day Broussard's body and her baby was found, even after Fierre Muska requested a lawyer. The judge sided with the prosecution. District Judge Selena Alvarenga denied the motion to suppress, shutting down Fierre Muska's team's request, meaning evidence and statements obtained can be used moving forward. While waiting for this ruling, KHOU spoke with Heidi's mother about the case and about her daughter over the phone. She always thought the best of everybody. I mean, she she never thought, she never saw any, anything bad in anybody. I'm telling you, that's the truth. Speaking to KHOU 11 by phone from Lake Charles, Louisiana, Heidi Broussard's mother, Tammy, can't believe the woman charged with the murder was her daughter's longtime friend. Came to our house, we loved you. You were welcomed in our home and we cared for you in our home. You know, where, what were you thinking to murder our daughter? Heidi would want us to forgive her and release her. That's my Heidi. But I would really want the chance to talk to her. After two years of painful delays, Tammy Broussard is ready for this case to go to trial, for all of this to be over. I want this whole thing finished to where my grandchildren are not asking them what happened. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson here with Reed Redman to talk a little bit more about this case. Reed, hearing about the allegations here, Two big questions come to mind. Why someone would fake a pregnancy and how someone could actually do that. So let's start with that first question. Have investigators offered any other insight into a possible motive here? Not a lot, but there is one line in Megan Fieramuska's arrest affidavit that 
maybe starts to address that question. It says, quote, members of the behavioral analysis unit provided an assessment of maternal desire, specifically that mothers have lost a pregnancy or have falsified pregnancy and have materialized the desire to have a child by taking possession of another child, end quote. Reading that, I was reminded of another case we covered a while back on this podcast, the abduction of Kamaya Mobley from a hospital in Florida right after she was born. And in that case, the woman who later confessed to abducting Kamaya Mobley, it's believed that she suffered a miscarriage right before that happened. There was another high-profile case in 2016 where a woman named Yesenia Sesmus was convicted of murdering a 27-year-old mother named Laura Abarca and kidnapping her baby right after Abarca had given birth. In that case, prosecutors had said that Sesmus had suffered a miscarriage as well, but then pretended she was still pregnant for months and then planned to kill Abarca and pass the baby off as her own. All investigators have really said about this aspect of this case is that they believe Megan Firamuska was faking her pregnancy, that she was not actually pregnant. But we'll see if that assessment from the FBI of maternal desire is a motive that prosecutors will argue at trial. And what about that second question, how Fira Muska allegedly pulled this off? There had to be some red flags at some point before December of 2019, right? Right. It sounds like nobody in Megan Fira Muska's life had any suspicions that she might be pretending to be pregnant until she was actually arrested. And that includes the man that she was living with, Chris Green. And what he said again is that he saw her stomach growing throughout her pregnancy. We don't have an explanation for how exactly that was happening He also said that he'd felt her stomach and that it was, quote, hard, but he said that he never saw her bare stomach. The arrest affidavit states, quote, Green stated that he never saw Megan Firamuska's bare stomach during the pregnancy, stating that their relationship during the year did not lend itself to seeing her in stages of undress, end quote. But of course, for someone to fake a pregnancy for nine months, there would have to be some red flags. You know, was she insisting on going to all of her medical appointments alone? What were the conversations about the baby like? And of course, the biggest red flag that we know about actually is the fact that nobody else was there to witness the birth. According to the affidavit, she actually left to go to the beach one day while Chris was staying in Houston to work. And then the next day, Fiera Muska told Chris, don't be mad. And that's when she showed him the baby, which she said she'd given birth to at a birthing center that she couldn't remember the name of. And some of the things that we've heard about in this episode are things that you might look at and say are red flags. There's the fact that she traveled to another city so late in her supposed pregnancy. There's that strange interaction with the baby's grandfather right after Heidi gave birth. There's the fact that that she hadn't been sending out photos of her new baby by the sound of it. So there were all these different things going on. But again, at the time, it doesn't seem like anyone was really all that suspicious of her. All right, Reed, thanks for bringing us this story this week. And also thanks to our partner station, KVU in Austin, Texas, and reporter Bryce Newberry. And thanks for listening to True Crime Chronicles. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.